Hi, this is Sandhya Mendonca and you're listening to my podcast Spotlight with Sandhya. Writers, scientists, artists, business leaders, politicians, you will find them and many other engaging people right here talking about what they do and how it impacts the world. The wars of the future will be fought over water. Across the world, water causes tension. It could be a territorial dispute or a fight for strategic advantage. Or, as we have experienced here in South India, it could be over the sharing of the precious waters of the river Kaveri. The journey of this river begins in the Kodugu district of Karnataka and it goes along 800 kilometers through Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala and Puducherry before joining the Bay of Bengal. Summers are hot enough here, but in the years when rains fail, the land would be boiling in a fight over its water. Millennials, perhaps, will not know how tense the situation would get, especially in the Bangalore, Mysore and Mandya regions when Karnataka was forced to release water to its neighbours. When I was a journalist, I was in the thick of covering the riots and as much as one sympathised with the farmers, it was frightening to be in the middle of the fracas. The Kaveri water issue simmered for over a couple of hundred years until it was resolved by the Supreme Court on February 16, 2018. Joining me on the show today is C. Chandrasekhar, a former IPS officer who has written a book titled Kaveri Dispute, A Historical Perspective. Chandru, what prompted you to write this book? Well, to begin with, I must uh, say I am very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, what prompted me to write this book is to put together as many facts as possible over a period of 410 years. And secondly, when I was a police officer, I saw very serious riots in which 21 people died in police firing and ethnic violence. And that moved me a great deal. The question before me was, why does a dispute over sharing of waters should result in this kind of violence? That opened up a lot of interest. And I started digging into the history of this dispute, which took me to the arrival of the British till the verdict of the Supreme Court, as you mentioned, in February 2018. Chandru, you grew up along the banks of a river, didn't you? Is that also one of the reasons that you're interested in water? Uh, very true, very true. I was born uh, in a small village called Malagalu on the left bank of river Arkavati, which is a minor tributary of the Kaveri. And my birth village, Malagalu, is now a part of Kanakapura town. As a young boy going into the river from my grandfather's house has such rich memories I can never forget. Uh, when the river was in floods, how and where you cross, can you cross at all? And sometimes we had a very beautiful sandy bed where you could simply go down and lie. And at night, I remember after dinner, I used to walk down into the Kaveri, into the Arkavati River and look northward towards Bangalore. And the dull, dull yellow haze of Bangalore lights was such a fascination for me. So I know how a river rules your life. I've experienced it in this small village where I was born. So it was the yellow haze of Bangalore that actually opened up your eyes to what was happening in the you know, in the dispute over the river Kaveri. Well, in 1991, I was still a superintendent of uh, police, working in Karnataka police. And that was the time when the matter was before 
the Kaveri Water Disputes Tribunal, which was formed in 1991, and on a request from Tamil Nadu in June 1991, the tribunal gave an interim award directing Karnataka to release 205 TMC of water in a water year, a water year meaning between June and May on a month-to-month -month schedule and it was somewhat difficult to stick to the schedule as the uh, difficulties experienced by the government of Karnataka was that uh, the tribunal had taken into consideration the flow in the river during the last 10 years only and two excessive years excluded, two deficient years excluded and only six years were taken into consideration. And to arrive at any practical uh, figure, six years, it was felt, was too short a period. But over a period of time, it did come to be resolved. Yeah. And I, I'm wondering now, why is your book of relevance today, since the matter has been resolved? It is of relevance for many reasons. Number one, the Supreme Court in its order in 2018 has said that this order will have a period of validity lasting for 15 years only and five years have already gone by and then we are left with just another 10 years. And there are many challenges uh, in, resort, in resolving other issues related to water which the government must take into consideration uh, very seriously. So from this point of view, I have said that the challenges before the government will have to be looked into very seriously and urgently. All right. So um, let's talk a little bit more about the history that has uh, been covered in this book. Why did this issue of sharing of the river Kaveri become contentious at all? Ah, oh, it's a it's a long story. You see, the the erstwhile state of Mysore never had any high dams for irrigation. The farmers depended mostly on tanks and river streams. When the monsoon was plentiful, when extra water flowed in the rivers, and small streams carried some water across to distant areas and farmers made use of this water for agriculture. But then, during the 50 years when the British fought four wars with the erstwhile state of Mysore, tanks had been neglected. And the first task in the reconstruction of the economy of the state and to give a sense of relief to the farmers, Divan Purnaya embarked on this challenge of restoration of tanks. That is when the farmers of Tanjavur objected to it, saying, if tanks are restored, if tanks are desilted, then the amount of water that normally flows into the Kaveri would be diminished. As a result, they will have to uh, suffer because of inadequate supply of water. Uh, and that is when this matter was inquired into by the resident in Mysore who did not find uh, any truth in this allegation. And this was in 1807, 1807. And the last war of Mysore was in 1799 when Tipu was killed and there was an agreement between the East India Company and the erstwhile state of Mysore. So the uh, real dispute about sharing of waters started in 1807. And how did it start? What was the reason? The reason, like I mentioned, was restoration of tanks, which they did not want. Desilting of tanks, which meant tanks would hold more water and then Madras presidency, I think, wanted to formalize a kind of an agreement 
with the state of Mysore. And they wrote saying that we should have an agreement which will uh, systematize flow of rivers in waters, which will tell us very clearly how and when to build dams, barrages, and how exactly we could use water. And that is when Devan Sheshadri Iyer felt that if we went by the kind of uh, restrictions that were contemplated in this agreement, he was of the opinion that uh, this would come in the way of future development of agriculture in the erstwhile state of Mysore and didn't want it. But it did go ahead, right? I mean, the agreement was put into place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who are the prime architects or the writers of this agreement? Uh, most of them, five of them were Englishmen. Mm -hmm. And uh, Devan Sheshadri Ayer was the only Indian. And meetings were held in Uti uh, prior to the signing of this agreement. And the proceedings were recorded. And uh, Devan Sheshadri Ayer wrote to the government of India with a copy of the proceedings saying that this is what was discussed and this will come in the way of future development of irrigation and hence they should not be uh, he also mentioned that if we have not been able to use the waters of the river it does not mean that we have no rights over the water for practical reasons we have not been able to use this water but this cannot be abrogated it cannot be said that we have no rights at all but the British government then said that no scheme which will come in the way of flow of water into British territory can be allowed. They used the term British territory. British territory. So they viewed Madras presidency as their territory and then Mysore being not completely independent but still a sovereign state. It was a vassal state. Yeah. It was called a vassal state. And then uh, a lot of discussion has been held on the term vassal state, imperial presidency, suzerainty and such other concepts wherein there is a definite hierarchy uh, and one could see that Mysore was much lower in this hierarchy and hence it could be uh, not exactly bulldozed but one could see that uh, they were made to accept many of the conditions that were very humiliating. So, uh, I think another very interesting point that you refer to in this book uh, is the Supreme Court's order, it's in its uh, order, uh, uh, 2018 yeah. order. There's a reference to something which I found very dramatic, the silence of the Sphinx. Could you elaborate about it? Uh, yes. What happened was the team of lawyers, advocates on behalf of Karnataka advanced a very um, strong argument saying that we were not on equal footing. Madras and Mysore, we were not on equal footing. And hence, these agreements signed in 1892 and 1924 should be given up and then the Supreme Court said that you had plenty of opportunities to come out of it. The first one was in 1937 when the Government of India Act was enacted and the second opportunity was in 1947 when the Independence of India Act was enacted. We could have asked for changes and the third opportunity was when we had the standstill agreement, as the name itself indicates, what should happen in the interregnum between this and that stage? What agreements can have validity? What agreements could be dispensed with? So this standstill agreement, you made no choice during the standstill agreement. And then the next opportunity was in 1951, when the Constitution of India uh, came into being and there again you did nothing 
and the last opportunity was 1956 when the reorganization of states was taken up where the priorities of the state were of prime concern and there again you remained quiet and the honorable supreme court said that you could have risen like the mythological bird phoenix out of your own ashes you could have resurrected yourself you did nothing but on the other hand you maintained silence like the sphinx in the deserts of egypt a very dramatic and also i think it's a reflection on the kind of leaders political leaders or so called statesmen that karnataka has had that they seem to have not seen the opportunities where they could have asked for redressal and i think it's a price that the people have paid for several long years i would remain uh, silent on this observation yes obviously you will you once a police officer always a police officer <laughs> and you have one of the former chief ministers coming to release your book so <laughs> i'm sure you're being very diplomatic no, in I'm that not, way i'm not being diplomatic i'm saying having been a government servant i'm governed by certain ethics which i should respect even after my retirement Luckily I don't have any such restrictions so I can speak my it's mind not, not, it, it is not a restriction like i said it is it is um, it's it's a kind of a discipline i have imposed on myself Okay so much water has flown down the kaveri since then and your book doesn't stop with the kaveri dispute alone you know uh, i takes into consideration um, several aspects of water management Uh, tell us some of the important points that you make in your book uh yes it's true it's true that my book doesn't stop with this dispute over kaveri um where the main contenders are four southern states it goes into larger aspects of water management you see we in this country have this paradoxical problem we have year after year each year we have floods and we have droughts and thousands of crores of rupees have been spent on floods and droughts but even after 70 odd years even after seven decades the problem of floods and droughts has not been resolved we have not gone into the root of the problem so the root of the the i think the solution lies in harnessing water resources there is no point spending crores of rupees on floods crores of rupees again on droughts and in the meantime there is a lot of damage to crops and people are put into hardships and people die livestock die and there is no drinking water and all this so i have said that the uh, bigger problem before the government is how do we look at harnessing of water resources is it possible at all to which we could solve this perennial problem of floods and droughts earlier one sir author cotton in 1858 had suggested the two rivers in the south could be interlinked uh, which could solve problems of water shortage in water deficient areas and this was considered uh, as a solution uh, at the national level and dr k l rao was one of our union ministers came up with a plan called the ganga kaveri link through which rivers from in india from the north to the south could be interlinked so that this shortage of water could be could be resolved in 2002 addressing the nation president abdul kalam spoke about shortage of water and the difficulties that people have been put into and this was taken up as a public interest litigation by the honorable supreme court of india 
and they said this is a this is a huge problem before the nation wherein all governments state governments and government of india should come together to find a solution and the supreme court invited the states to file any complaints any objections if they had and to my knowledge no state came up with any kind of objections but what has happened since then i mean it's been a very long time since then yeah. we don't see anything happening in terms of in, implementing this in 2012 the supreme court gave its ruling uh, saying that the government of india should come up with a detailed plan of interlinking of rivers which could be taken up in a phased manner and in last year's budget two rivers ken and betwa link has been taken up and a certain amount of money has been earmarked by the government of india so a beginning has already been made and i hope this will be uh, a solution to uh, the perennial problem of floods and droughts i hope so too and uh, i really wish that uh, the people in power and in you know in the bureaucracy would read your book i think it's a book that all of us must read because we will also learn how to conserve water and the origins of various water disputes okay chandru now coming back to your you as a person um how long were you in the police force i was in the police for 32 years and when you retired uh what was the post that you were holding i retired as an inspector general of police and my the post i retired from was igp headquarters in the in the chief office uh this was 32 years the police and before that i was a teacher i started my career as a lecturer at national college paswanagudi yeah okay usually when people retire they play golf or they go on long holidays but you seem to be a history buff you know um you were a very popular uh, police commissioner in mysore and i know a couple of years ago you uh, led a book discussion about uh, yuval harari's homo deus a brief history of tomorrow and i remember then you said that uh, history is taught as a set of dead facts and that's the reason most people do not want to study history or they don't like it so with your background as a teacher yourself do you have any pointers about how history as a subject could be taught better oh and this takes me back to literature yes i'm all yes, ears yes eliot's four quartets it's a it's a long poem it says it begins with time past and time present are perhaps present in time future I mean, it's very great to read this mm, musically rich poem the four quartets but it also talk, talks about how time is not an independent entity the past influences the present the present influences the future and we unfortunately when we were kids we were always taught history as a set of dead facts and historians like harari now have given a new definition saying that history is not a set of dead facts history in fact influences the future too and that is the way we must look at history and so today we are in this phase when we are looking at the history of this dispute it takes us back 400 years and we still haven't found a solution that is agreeable to all the four contenders right so what has influenced your writing style i don't know if i have a style of my own this is my first humble endeavor into writing and my the, the the brief i gave myself was to put all the facts concerning the kaveri dispute between two covers um 
and then i don't know i mean i have so many other subjects i want to write about including not exactly my own life some of my experiences in the police the personalities i have met in my life the events that i have been a witness to especially the farmers movement in shumaga and the kind of changes that have taken place in vvip security and such other things so i want to write about how perspectives have been changing and i want to write about my experiences in such a way that it is not my life but it becomes a document of a time i think that sounds very interesting it's something that i look forward to reading mm. i also come to know that you have a great interest in music could you tell me a little bit more about it well i listen to all kinds of music i think i have a great catalysticity of taste from the deepest in classical music to hard rock is the range but given a choice i would always settle down to what a 45 minute deep ala on the sarod so i am an ardent admirer of the mayer kharana and its music and i have a lot of music from ustad ali akbar khan sahab and his senior disciple who was a great influence on my life dr rajiv taranath who lives in mysore so i have collection from these great masters uh that fill my soul that stir my soul so music i think is my true language wonderful um do you also play any instrument or sing yourself the only instrument i play is the tape recorder <laughs> <laughs> thank you for giving me this time to discuss this very interesting book kaveri dispute a historical perspective it should be available and most bookstores and online very soon and uh, thank you for joining me on spotlight with sandhya chandru it's been a very insightful session and to our listeners do subscribe to spotlight with sandhya you can hear this podcast on every major audio app and i'll be back soon with another interesting guest <laughs>